Good morning, Central. It is a great morning just to be able to worship together online. I want to just let you know about a few things going on in the life of our church right now. The men's ministry is sponsoring a bike and hike at Wissahickon Valley Park. It's going to be a great time for really just families to gather together and, and just have fun, you know, biking and hiking and just exploring nature. We're going to be meeting at Valley Green Inn and then going on our way from there. We also want to let you know the trails are wide enough to where social distancing can be practiced while we're on this bike and hike. We hope you're able to make it out and you know Pastor Anthony even let me know if you register on our website when you register you're entered into a drawing um, and there are prizes available so um, I hope that you jump on that and maybe you'll be the lucky one that gets that prize. We also want to let you know October 11th so this coming week is our next outdoor worship service and I know for me, it has been such a gift to be able to worship with my church family in person. You can register online. We hope to see you there. Central, today is the last day to vote on Pastor Anthony's new position. We have called him to be our lead pastor of mission, and you can head to our website to see a video presentation and really to get more information on how to vote and, and all of those kinds of things. But today is the last day to vote. We hope you hop in there. Before we, we you know, really just observe our offering, I wanted to read some scripture. And this is really just about the early church in Acts chapter two. It says this in verse 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. 
Central, when I read these verses, I know that this is the church that Central strives to be. And in a lot of ways, I've seen Central do this as a church. You can know this morning that when you give, you know, these are the kinds of things you're giving to so that we can meet needs wherever you are. We can meet needs in our community and we can meet needs in our church body. So Central, this morning, there's a few ways that you can give. You can give online, you can give via text, you can even come by our church building and drop it off in our drop box. But we just wanna remind you that when we give, we're really trying to advance God's kingdom right here in Ewing. So Central, we love you so much. We hope that you're blessed by our service this morning. Enjoy our service. Well, good morning. Welcome to Central. My name is Tim Loesch, one of the elders, and I'll be sharing with you today. As we move into a time of worship, I'd like to quote a verse from scripture and then pray for us. The verse that I'd like to quote is one that you may know, and if you don't know it, I would encourage you to memorize it, but it's John 3, 16. So if you'd know it, I would ask that you'd say it along with me right now. It goes like this, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever should believe in him should not, will not perish and have everlasting life. You know, that reference, John 3.16, we see plastered all over. We see it at sporting events, sometimes it's vandalism on an overpass. And I don't know how much we use it in church. And yet it's such a great verse that sums up the gospel, that God loves us sinners, that he would have his son die on the cross in our place so that we would not be separated from God, but we would live with him eternally. So today as we worship, as we go into a time of communion later, my hope is that the gospel will be in the forefront of your mind, what God did for you in sending his son Jesus to die on the cross because he loves us. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray now that you would remove any distraction that is taking place. I pray that you would open our minds and soften our hearts, Father. I pray that your scripture would be illuminated to give us new understanding. I pray that your Holy Spirit would do a great work in our hearts repairing the areas that need fixing. Father, I pray that this service would be glorifying to you, that as we sing of your love, Father, we will recognize how much you love us. We pray this in your name. Amen.
Well, good morning. Today we'll be concluding our series on sweet dreams, the things that keep us up at night, and we'll be concluding with this topic of anger. And for each of these subjects that we've covered over the last few weeks, I believe each of them could each be a three to four week sermon series in and of themselves. There's just so much to talk about with each of these emotions. And the same is true for anger. So I don't want to waste any time, and I'd like to dive in and talk about what the Bible tells us about anger. And I'd like to start with uh, four foundational truths. If you were to look up anger in the Bible, these are the four things that will probably pop out at you first. And then I'd like to get into more specifics about how we can handle our anger. So let me get started. The first thing is this. If you were to read the Bible, you would see that God gets angry. Uh, Particularly in the Old Testament, you'll see an angry God. In fact, he kind of seems cranky at times. We see him that when he's mad at Israel, he's mad at the Canaanites and he's mad at certain individuals. But most often, God is mad at sin. God has perfect character, and sin offends perfect character. So God gets angry. And we might be thinking, wait a minute, I thought God was one of love. How can you say he's angry? But I believe that because God is love, it's what makes him angry. The same way as a parent. If you have a child, um, they at times make you angry. You love them deeply. But they may choose sin, they may make bad decisions that angers you because you do not want them to go down a wrong path because you love them. And it's the same way with God. He doesn't like sin, and he doesn't want us to go down the wrong path. And you think about it even further than that as a parent. I know for me, I'll speak for myself, I'm flawed, I'm self-centered, and if I can feel that much anger towards a sin that my child chooses to do, just think how much more it offends God, who's morally perfect, And oh, by the way, he created us. So God is one of anger, but he is also one of love. In Psalms 103, it sums that up. It says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. His anger and love are all a part of his perfect character. But God's anger is always under control. It's always righteous, and it's always rooted in love. So that's the first thing. If you were to look at the Bible, you'd see about anger. God gets angry. On top of that, the second thing, you'll see that Jesus gets angry. Jesus was angry with the leaders who were interested in protocol more so than uh, a man being healed in Mark 3, 5. In John 2 is when we know that Jesus was angry when people were using the temple as a way to make a profit. In Mark 10, Jesus is not happy with his disciples as they were turning away the children. So interestingly, as we look at Jesus and when he's angry, we see that he's most angry when others, other people's welfare was at stake. We don't actually see times when Jesus himself was angry over the times that he was violated. He was not like us in that regard. So even though people tested him, they accused him of being from the devil, they betrayed him, they denied him, they spat on him, we don't see Jesus expressing anger in those particular situations. And Peter sums that up in 1 Peter 2.23, he says, when they heaped abuse on him, He did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly, his father. So what are you saying, Tim? If someone wrongs us, we can't get angry because Jesus didn't? No, I'm not actually saying that. But I do think it's worth seeing in the Bible that Jesus sets a very high standard that he is not going to be controlled by the injustices of others. We don't have to allow others to have power over our emotions. Jesus was confident that his father was in control and there would be justice in the end. So when Jesus was personally wronged, his response was one of love and service. Pretty high standard. And sometimes, I know as a young Christian, I remember thinking this way, Jesus was flipping tables and we get caught up on that. We're like, he's flipping tables. Sounds a lot like a sin. All right? But we know the Bible and Hebrews tells us that Jesus was without sin. And I don't know why we'd want to pin sin on Jesus because then he would not be the perfect sacrifice, which puts us all really in trouble. But speaking of sin, the third thing that we can learn quickly from the Bible, is just a quick overview, the Bible tells us to be angry, but do not sin. It's first mentioned in Psalm 4.4, but then Paul says it again in Ephesians 4.26. He says, in your anger, 
do not sin. Now, if you go back to verse 1 of Ephesians 4, Paul starts off that chapter by saying, uh, to make sure that you walk in a manner worthy of the calling of which you've been called. So your reaction to anger, the way you carry it out, should be uh, worthy of the calling which you've been called. It should be worthy of how you've been called. I think that's important. In the world of therapy and counseling, we like to say that we should validate the feeling, but not necessarily validate the action. So we don't blame people, hey, you're angry. I can understand that. I'd be angry too. But you have to think about what you're going to do with that anger. We're allowed to be angry. The Bible never actually tells us how to feel, but it does tell us how to act. And it specifically says, do not sin. So as with all emotions, the most important thing to learn is how to express them in a positive way. Um, Because when we don't handle it correctly, it can lead to something dangerous. Which brings us to our fourth quick foundational point on anger. That anger can be dangerous. You might remember a poster that hung up in your elementary school that said, anger is one letter short of danger. Very true, very corny, but also very true. You know, Ephesians 4.26 is where Paul said, in your anger do not sin. And in 4.27, Paul says, don't let the devil get a foothold. And he's specifically talking about anger there because if you're not in control of your anger, the devil will gladly take over. Satan partners with anger. He loves the fact that anger can be destructive and damaging. It it destroys marriages, relationships, careers. It can bring divide to churches. Satan loves that stuff. Anger can be dangerous. And we know the wounds of anger can run very deep. Our Our anger can hurt those who are close to us, sometimes innocent victims, sometimes doing real damage to someone we love. Our anger can be misplaced. We can be mad at someone at work and take it out on somebody at home. The Bible warns us several times. In Proverbs 14, 17, it says, A quick-tempered man acts foolishly. Proverbs 29, 22 says, An angry person stirs up conflict. A hot-tempered man commits many sins. James 1, 20 says, Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Mishandling anger can be very damaging. Now, aside from all the warnings in the Bible of how dangerous anger can be, there's also a physical toll that anger can have on your body. Uh, If you're just an angry person with a short fuse, or if you've been holding on to anger for a long time, that can take a toll on your body. It can lead to increased uh, high blood pressure, blood blood pressure, heart disease, stress that comes from being angry simply is not healthy. And this isn't something that should be overlooked. But it is important for me to say, while anger is dangerous, if we channel that anger in a proper fashion, it can also be a great motivator for us to go on and do great things maybe even bring change about what brought us anger. It can push us to reach our goals and to be brave. So anger, again, can be channeled correctly and do great things, but most often, if we're not careful, it can be very dangerous. So why is this important to know? We need to know this because we have to have control over our anger. There's times when it's an appropriate thing, right? The Bible, or we often say that's a righteous anger. We're angry over the things that God is angry at, and that is appropriate. But we still need to respond in a way that is safe, and pleasing to the Lord. So, how do we control our anger? Those were four quick foundational things we see in the Bible, but now I'd like to get a little bit more specific on how we control our anger. Now, as we talk about these specific, obviously, we all have different personalities. We all handle anger differently. Some of us are more happy-go-lucky, while others, we're a little more short-tempered. We have a short fuse. If you're not sure if you have a short fuse, you could simply ask the person that you're sitting next to, see what kind of happens there. It could be a very interesting experiment. Um, But even if you're not short-tempered, there's things, if you're just a regular person that handles things well, there's still things that are going to anger you. But there also might be some of you that have some deep-rooted anger due to something that happened to you at some point in your life. You were wronged in some way, and you are legitimately angry about that. But you remain angry about that situation and you haven't fully dealt with it. And we'll talk about that as well. So I think the principles in the Bible can help us learn to handle our anger and cope with it in a positive way. So what do we do with it when we're angry? As I thought about this first point, I tried to think of an example that we could all relate to. And I thought of one and I thought, you know what? Anytime someone talks about anger, they bring up this illustration. And I don't know if I want to do what's always been said. But then as I thought about it more, 
everyone can relate to this illustration of anger. It's called road rage. All of us who have a license have experienced road rage, okay? And even if you don't have a license, surely you've driven with somebody and you've heard them say, pick a lane. Or you've said, what are you waiting for, the pole to turn green? Or what I've, I sometimes will say, oh, I'm not letting you in. You should have merged back there when the sign said to, right? We're not letting people in that try to cut up. So even if you don't have a license, surely you've experienced road rage. It's a big thing that all of us who drive have dealt with. I learned recently, I did a lot of shopping for my family during the pandemic. I, I actually have shopping cart rage. I'm still stunned. You know, I don't follow the arrows very much anymore. That's on me. Maybe I upset others. But I'm stunned that people just come flying out of the aisle. They don't look both ways. I'm like, you're, you're reckless here. Or people park their cart right in the middle of the aisle. So you've got to, not sure if you lift up your cart to get by. You don't want to touch it, not with corona going around. So I, I realize sometimes I have a little shopping cart rage, and I'm working on that. But road rage, it's a problem. It's a big problem. And let's for a moment uh, think that you're driving down uh, Route 31 here, Pennington Road, and somebody cuts you off. Immediately, your first reaction might be one of fear, like, oh no, you're worried for your safety. But that fear quickly turns to anger. How dare they? They cut me off. They don't care about my safety. And this is going through our brain. Now I'm having fun with it, but this is the actual psychological process that goes through our brain. We're angry. Our life in some form was a little threatened right now. All right, we're not happy that they valued their life more important than ours. And we're starting to get revved up. In our, in our brain, the stress hormones, hormones are bouncing off the walls. There's a lot of information going on and we wanna react and rather than think it through. And so, uh, you know, Chris talked about this a couple weeks ago. We all have a fight or flight response. And in this situation, we wanna fight. Now, we're not gonna do anything dumb like ram the car. We're not gonna get out and start kicking their door. But they need to know that they made us upset. There has to be some kind of revenge or retribution. So what sometimes happens, when somebody cuts you off, sometimes they, they're off. You don't see them ever again. But sometimes people are in such a hurry, they cut you off, and then they wind up at the same light you did. They didn't get very far, did they? So you now have an opportunity to give them a little piece of your mind. So you carefully change lanes because we're good drivers. We come alongside of them, right? We may roll down the window, and we're going to give them a piece of our mind. And the first thing we do is we check, make sure it's nobody from Central because then it gets really awkward. But then we may give them a piece of our mind. So if I'm driving here, I'm looking at you, all right? We're like, what are you doing? Were you on your phone? How do you not see this big old car? Do you need glasses? No offense to those with glasses in our Anger, our judgment's cloudy, and we say things we don't mean, and our filter goes out the window. But we just can't understand what their problem is. And you know what the person's doing that's guilty, because we've done this if we're guilty. We're just standing there, we kind of look straight ahead. Don't make eye contact, right? Because we know they're going off, right? Just keep playing, you know, going along, listen to music, turn it up a little bit, right? But what's happening there? We are getting mad, okay? We are our... Our anger is starting to rise. The temperature is rising. All this stuff is going through our brain. But what needs to happen there is we need to initiate a process that will start to de-escalate our agitation, that will start to bring us down so that we can make a safe, responsible response that is pleasing to the Lord. And what is that response to counterpunch that agitation? The Bible says if you walk by the Spirit, you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. The flesh wants to give a pers that person a piece of our mind. But the Spirit says, I'm going to love that person, even though they've dangerously cut me off. So to walk in the Spirit is one way where we can have some control over our anger. To walk in the Spirit means that we yield to the Spirit's control, to follow His lead, and allow Him to exert His influence over us moment by moment on a daily basis. To be Spirit-dependent in our walk means that we have a conscious determination to rely on this resource of the Holy Spirit which dwells in us so that we can make an obedient and safe response and that we will not carry out the desires of our flesh. As believers in Christ, as children of God, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. And it doesn't mean we'll never get angry. It doesn't mean we'll be perfect. But it means we have a power source for us to use in any situation, in any emotion that comes along, whether it's anger, whether it's fear, whether it's sadness, we have the Holy Spirit. And the more that we immerse ourselves in seeking to be like Jesus Christ, 
the more natural those spirit-honoring, spirit-filled responses will come out of us. That's called the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those things will ooze out of us as we immerse ourselves into walking with Christ, as we show that the Spirit is, lives within us and he will give us power. The Holy Spirit is our advocate, our helper. He's there for us to use. Next week, we're going to be starting a, a series on the Holy Spirit, and those guys leading it will do so much better in explaining the Holy Spirit. But we must take advantage of the power of the Holy Spirit within us, especially to control us when we get anger. But that means walking with the Spirit. That means immersing ourselves in Jesus Christ, deepening our relationship with him. So to get some control over your anger, walk in the Spirit. The second thing uh, I'd like to share, uh, I'll start with another story, uh, a story where I was kind of angry. So I formerly used to work at Bucks County Correctional, Correctional Facility in Doylestown, and I left there in January of 2014 on good terms. I had a better opportunity closer to home. And about two and a half years later, June of 2016, about five o'clock on a Friday, I received a call from a lawyer representing Bucks County Correctional Facility. And they said, uh, Mr. Loesch, we want to let you know that you've been named in a lawsuit. And I was rather stunned. I didn't remember any negative things going on. I left on good terms with, with everybody. Um, so I asked the lawyer, I said, well, why am I being sued? And she said, that's the thing. I don't know right now. And I said, well, that's not good. When can you tell me? She said, well, that's the thing. Our office flooded, so I won't be able to get into it until late next week. I'm like, oh, so this is great. So you're telling me on a 5 o'clock on a Friday that I'm being sued. You don't know why, and you're not going to know for maybe another week. And she's like, yeah, that's pretty much it. I'm like, oh, I'm so glad you're representing me. I, I'm in such great hands here. What I would later learn about a week later, that there was an inmate suing the facility and named me as a part of that lawsuit with like 10 other people because he received poor dental care. Now here's the problem. I never once touched anybody's teeth while they were in jail. I was never checking out anybody's mouth. I did not work in the dental department. I worked in the mental health department. I was a counselor there. I had worked with this patient individually, or excuse me, inmate individually and as a group. Um, and so I guess he remembered me, my name and figured, hey, I might as well sue him too, even though I had nothing to do with it. So it was kind of funny. I'm like, all right, I'm a little mad, but this is obviously, I'm not, this isn't going to go forward. I have nothing to do with it. But on top of that, the lawyer informed me that I was also risking legal consequences because the inmate's lawyers delivered the paperwork to the jail, and the jail would neither confirm or deny that I worked there. And at that point, two years later, I was not working there. So now I was facing legal consequence for not receiving paperwork that was never given to me. And they admitted in the lawsuit that they only made one attempt. Never came to my house, never called. So again, I'm like, wow, this is really interesting. And I was just looking at the paperwork last night. It's really interesting to see your name on a bunch of fancy legal paperwork where I'm trying to be sued. So I was angry, rightly so. I was not really worried or scared that something would happen because I knew it was all kind of bogus. Again, I had nothing to do with the guy's teeth. But I was angry. And I was determined if this case leads me to take any minute of my time off work or any time away from my family, I'm going to counter sue. I'll sue for defamation. I don't even know if I could do that, but I was angry. As it turned out, it only required a few emails and I was dropped from the lawsuit, as I expected. But there comes a time in any situation when you're angry, in my anger and in your anger, where we have to take a step back and appraise the situation. There are psychologists out there that are anger researchers and there's different theories on appraisal, but basically it's taking a moment and assessing the situation. And it will help you determine what your next steps will be. The Bible gives us that prescription in James. James 1.19, it says this. Uh, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So when something makes you angry, the first thing it says to do there is to be quick to listen. If you read that plainly, it's telling us that we need to make sure we listen to all the facts. Listen to the explanation. Doesn't mean you're going to agree with everything. But get the whole story so that you don't jump conclusions. This is part of appraising the situation. And now those are good and wise things to do. We need to do those things. But Bible scholars actually tell us when James said this, he's actually saying be quick to listen to the word of God, to the words of God. How would God want you to respond in this situation? We all know that saying, you have two ears and one mouth, so we need to listen more than we talk. 
And so we need to be quick to listen, but the second thing it says to be slow to speak. When we're, a lot, we're, excuse me, when we're mad, a lot of words can come flying out of our mouth. Your mouth often moves faster than your brain, and we'll say words that we often forget, or excuse me, that we often regret, and that are mean, and we don't actually mean them. Proverbs 18, 13 says, to answer before listening, that is folly and shame. Be slow to your open your mouth. At all times, we should always be slow to speak, but particularly when you're angry. The last thing there, it says slow to get angry. Sometimes when we take those first steps, when we are quick to listen, when we're slow to speak, we realize that we have not very much to be angry about. Slow it down. The first reaction, we want to blow up. We want to get mad. We want to pop off. But the Bible says slow down. Slowing down things uh, allows us sometimes to look inward. It's a good opportunity for us to examine ourselves. Sometimes we can realize that our anger is actually masking other emotions like fears, like sadness, our disappointments. Sometimes we have to dig deep to find those things. Sometimes we need help to find those things. So slowing things down allows us to kind of look inwardly. Why am I mad about this? Maybe I don't need to be. But slowing things down also allows us to gain some perspective. And anger often lacks proper perspective. That's why you read about parents fighting at Little League games. That's why in the Philadelphia, areas, there, there's, in the Philadelphia area, there's TVs that are broken because people have been watching the Eagles lately. They lack a pop, proper perspective of what really is important. Slowing things down helps with that. Another verse to support that, Proverbs 15, 18, or excuse me, 15, 28. The heart of the righteous studies how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. Don't just pop off whatever comes to mind. Give an answer, but study it, ponder it, think about it before you give it. So the second thing there to help us with our anger is to go through those motions of being quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Now, the last advice the Bible gives on anger that I'd like to share with you is by far the toughest of them all. It's really easy for me to say and suggest, but very hard for anyone to put into action. If you've been carrying anger for a while, and it may be a very legitimate reason to be angry, a righteous anger, God tells us to forgive. I realize that some of you uh, may have turned off the TV now or closed the laptop, but it's hard for me to ignore what the Bible says, and the Bible says forgive. All throughout the Bible, we see forgiveness. We see it uh, in the Old Testament with Joseph forgiving his brothers who sold him into slavery. We see it when Peter asked Jesus, how many times am I supposed to give and forgive? And Jesus says, 70 times seven, keep on forgiving. We see it with Stephen forgiving those who murdered him. We see it with Jesus, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. We see it with the father who welcomes home his wayward son and treats him like a prince. And we also see it with God. And he says, look, you need to forgive because I've forgiven you. The Bible is all about forgiveness. It's one big picture of grace and mercy. And forgiveness is what God tells us to do. And I, I must repeat it so I'm clear. There's nothing easy about it. It's really easy, me, easy for me to say because uh, I'm in an empty room. There's nobody here to give me a stank eye and like, Tim, you have no idea the pain I'm going through, the anger that I feel. And I don't. I will not pretend to. But I can't ignore what's in the Bible and I can't pick and choose what I want to follow in the Bible. And the Bible says in Ephesians 4.32, forgive each other just as God in Christ forgave you. We are called to forgive someone. Now, let me say very quickly, on the flip side of that, if you have angered somebody, it might be that you have to ask for forgiveness. If you are the offender, you need to go and make it right. But in this particular point, I do want to talk about when we are angry, we need to forgive. Now, there's a whole host of scenarios there, and we obviously won't be able to cover them all. But let me give you some thoughts on forgiveness. It's important that we know what forgiveness is. As it's used in the Bible, forgiveness means to release, to set free. It's used of the cancellation of a debt or a release from a legal obligation. When we, as children of forgive, when we as children of God are forgiven, our debts, they were nailed to the cross and we were released from our penalty of sin. In terms of our topic this morning, we are, if we forgive others, we are releasing the offender. It frees us from anger and bitterness that we may have. It's saying what you did is still very wrong, but, and I won't forget it, but I will not allow it to take up space in my mind any longer. I'm taking back control of what occupies my mind and energy and time. What we see in the Bible also is that forgiveness always comes at a cost, and the cost is paid for by the forgiver, not the forgiven. The best and obvious example of that is Christ himself. 
The cost and the price for our sin would be the shedding of blood. But that's not a cost that we paid. That's a cost that he paid. We, the forgiven, did not pay that cost. We deserved it, but Christ paid it for us. Please understand, as the Bible teaches, forgiving someone doesn't mean that you condone their behavior. It does not mean that justice cannot be served. It does not mean that we forget how they hurt you or give them opportunity to do that again. It does not mean that we should forgive and forget. That's not a biblical quote necessarily. Now I will say that I do believe that relationships can be restored. God has that power and I hope that is always the case. But forgiving others means acknowledging your wound and giving yourself permission to feel the pain and recognize why that pain no longer serves you. It means letting go of the hurt and resentment so that you can heal and you can move forward. Often, if we're holding on to anger, the one most damaged by that is us, not the person who offended us. So for our own health and well-being, we have to forgive. For our own spiritual health and, wealth, uh, health and well-being, we need to forgive. With God, the impossible can happen. We can have the strength to forgive and possibly restore that relationship. This is the biblical response which God calls us to do. So that sums up my thoughts on forgiveness and how we can have some handle on it. We should walk in the spirit to control our anger. We should remember to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry, to get some perspective on things. But also, if we are angry, we need to learn to forgive. And as we're talking about forgiveness, it actually provides a really good transition into our time of communion. See, the greatest act of forgiveness that we'll ever know and ever witness is the fact that God forgave us sinners. And truthfully, the greatest amount of wrath that we could ever witness is the wrath that, Je or that Jesus took on instead of us. God's wrath was poured out on Jesus instead of us so that we can be forgiveness. So anger and forgiveness are actually uh, related to communion. And it was at the Last Supper when Jesus demonstrated communion for us. It was there at the Last Supper when Jesus knew that one of his disciples, Judas, would betray him. And yet, Jesus still fed Judas. Jesus still washed his feet because Jesus loves. Jesus loved Judas and he loves me. Judas really represents us and Jesus showed him love and that's the love that God has shown us when he forgave us. So it was at the Last Supper when Jesus would refer to his coming death on the cross. He took some bread and he broke it to represent his body and he said, this also represents my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It was also at the Last Supper when Jesus took the cup. And he said, there's a new covenant, there's a new agreement. My blood is going to be poured out for you, and the agreement is now that you can be a child of God. You can one day live with me forever. And it's because of my blood which has been shed for you. Paul summed that up in Romans 5, 9. He said, we have been justified by the blood of Christ. We were saved from God's wrath. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray as we close out our morning together. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, that you would love us enough to allow him to come to this earth and die on a cross for our sins. He paid the cost of our sins. He paid the cost of forgiveness that we should have paid. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for Jesus. Father, we thank you for your spirit as it dwells inside of us. And I pray that the spirit would be active and helping us to control our anger so that we don't run into dangerous situations. I pray that the Spirit would be active in helping us to forgive others, even when it seems impossible. Father, with you, nothing is impossible. Father, as we go forth, Father, again, I pray that we will always remember the gospel, that you would love us enough to die for us, and that one day again we can be with you, and it's for that we give you great thanks. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. What a great message from our very own Tim Loesch. We realize that God might have been working on your heart during that message, and we just want to give you a few ways that you can respond. There's our Connect card. It's on all of our platforms, and you can write your prayer request in there and know that you'll be followed up with this week. We also want to let you know that our prayer line is available. You'll see the number on your screen right now, and for the next hour, there'll be a live person on the other end 
you know, really just there to pray with you and to minister to you. Senator, we want to remind you just to register for two things um, before we say goodbye. And that's our bike and hike that our men's ministry is sponsoring and our outdoor service coming up this week. We also want to remind you, this is the last day to vote on Pastor Anthony's new position that we've called him to. So hop on our website for more details for the video presentation and to vote. Senator, we also want to remind you, um, you know, we are just so thankful for how you've continued to give in a, you know, really a confusing season. And we want to remind you that your giving allows us to do all sorts of ministry from kids to students, to life groups, to what you saw today. It allows us to really to advance God's kingdom as he's called us to do. So Central, we love you so much. We're so thankful that you worshiped with us today. Have a great week.